Hi, good evening, folks. My name is Delia Henry. I've got an absolute pleasure to be chairing this event tonight. I'm one of the ALAPA candidates in the West of Scotland, and I'm going to introduce the panel to you. And I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear what everyone's got to say. Our main speaker tonight is Susan Smith from Four Women Scotland. And I'm sure, like me, this, this audience will be so well respected of Four Women Scotland and the work that they do for women across Scotland. And I was delighted when Susan uh, agreed to come along tonight. Susan's one of the directors of Four Women Scotland. She's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we're going to have a Q&A session. And in the Q&A session, we've got three other ALAPA candidates, three women. We've got Caroline McAllister, who's standing with me in the West of Scotland. We've got Lynn Anderson, who's standing in Central Scotland, and she's also a councillor. And Michelle Ferns, who's standing in Glasgow, a, a councillor, and is standing in Glasgow on the list for the West, uh, for an ALAPA party. So it's our genuine pleasure to have everyone along tonight. We've got over, um, we've got 100 people joining us at the moment and 180 women registered. And this, I think, bears testament to the work that the Alaba Party have been doing on the women's inequalities policy. And it's telling us that women are really want to hear what we've got to say. Um, and you might think I'm going to say that anyway, but it's really one of the main reasons I'm part of this party. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to hand over to Susan and she's going to talk us through the work that the uh, women in Scotland do for um, all of us and the differences that they're making in, in women's lives in Scotland. So thank you, Susan, over to you. Thank you very much, Delia, for that um, wonderful introduction. That's extremely kind of you. And thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, for, for those who don't know, um, For Women Scotland is a, a non-partisan group of women from all across Scotland. We come from a variety of different backgrounds and we came together after the second, uh, the first GRA consultation in 2018 because we were extremely concerned by some of the things that had come up during that consultation and some of the implications for women and women's rights. And um, from then we've gone on to look at a whole raft of other stuff that um, government and organisations and councils and so on are, are doing. Um, so it's, as far as we're concerned, it's an absolute delight when we hear political parties or politicians pledging to support and uphold the Equality Act, because that's really our big, um, our big issue that we feel that um, things have been for women it's we've been a bit beleaguered of late and um that it's very important that we are able to talk about issues around legislation and around the implications for women's rights and the impact on the equality act so for those who don't know the equality act 2010 is the main piece of equality legislation um, in the uk and it covers nine protected characteristics one of these is sex um, it also has a characteristic of gender reassignment and problems that have arisen recently that we've encountered is that sometimes these two characteristics have been conflated, even though the Equality Act is very clear that when it refers to sex, it does mean male and female. And in 2015, some of the lobby groups um, tried to persuade the government in Westminster to remove the single sex exceptions from the act. And when that failed, their tactics changed. And from then there has been a pretty sustained campaign to reform the Equality Act, but not openly, um, often undermining it, can, can creating confusion around definitions. Um, and I think the long-term goal has been to render some of it obsolete. So, some examples of what we've been doing, I mean, currently we are fighting in the courts over a piece of legislation called the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. Um, we lost our, um, at the JR stage in the court of sessions, so we are going to appeal that. We think it's, the judgment is very legally appealable. 
I can't talk too much about that because that's obviously a live case, but I would recommend an excellent blog on Murray Blackburn Mackenzie's site about the current state. But in terms of that piece of legislation, it's quite typical of some of the things that have been happening. It was introduced in 2018, and it was supposed to um, address historic underrepresentation of women on public boards by setting a 50% target for female representation. And originally, the Scottish government had said that this objective was for those who are female or identify as female. Um, but there was a consultation in 2017 and that was changed to women. And the policy memorandum said that this was taken to ensure um, the bill reflect the protective characteristic in the Equality Act. However, as so often with these things, it then it becomes complicated. And at stage two, after a representation from Scottish Trans Alliance, the the definite the it wasn't changed. Women wasn't taken out, but the definition of woman was changed. So suddenly, instead of women representing sex as per the Equality Act, which defines woman as a female of any age, it became conflated with the characteristic of gender reassignment. And it was expanded to include people who hadn't changed their legal sex by using a DRC. And it also excluded uh, people who were legally female, but didn't state that they identified as women. Um, so in effect, this became a protection for gender identity rather than sex. And gender identity is not a protected characteristic, although as we repeatedly see, a lot of people tend to believe these days that it is. The draft guidance, which expanded on this definition of women, um, said that there was no need to make any changes in your life. You didn't have to look or dress a certain way. You just had to be um, living continuously as a woman. And the examples that were given in the um, draft guidance were people who used a female name, um, had a female title on their bank account or their utility bill, um, described themselves as a woman in written co um, communication and used female pronouns. And then to add insult to injury, it went on to say the act didn't even require the person making the appointments to the board to check that these people were even doing that. So when the Scottish government consulted in 2019 about this, um, they got over 300 responses and most of them answered the terminology question. There was a question, do you have an issue with the terminology? And people said, yes, actually, we've got, a, we've got an issue with this one about women and the protected characteristics. Um, and they just said this was out with the scope of the consultation so they wouldn't address it. Um, so we had so many questions and I think most women would have so many questions about this. Now, how does how does somebody live as a woman? Um, what is a female name? I mean, I, I don't know where this leaves people called Hillary and Lindsay and Leslie, for example. And are rights only based on your own self-perception or how we compel other people to talk about us? Or are they based on material fact? Are they based on things we can help or things that we can just change at whim? And I think in that sense, this legislation also has to be looked at a raft of other um, measures. Some of them are legal and some of them are social, which are being used really to sneak in um, an undermining of women's protections and their self ID by, by the back door. So to take one example from this bill pronouns, um, the level of proof required to say you're a woman in this act is pretty negligible. Um, it doesn't require, as I say, a medical uh, transition or any outward change. You just need the name, title, utility bill, and pronouns. And I would say third person pronouns are in the gift of others. It reflects how people talk about you when you're in the room. It's you and I when we're having a conversation. Um, 
So how, how do you compel people to speak about you in a certain way? And I think that this is where we see attempts to coerce the speech of women now. And it ranges from a sort of guilt tripping, you have to be kind to people, or to more sinister actions, which can range from anything from trying to get women banned off social media, or to threats. And all the time on top of this, we're told it costs nothing. You can just be nice. It costs nothing to call Eddie Izzard, she, her. Eddie Izzard, who has built a career, a successful career, uh, all power to him as a male um, comedian, suddenly has decided um, that he would like to be addressed as she and her. And everybody has to run around. And, an adapt speech and get lengthy articles in the Guardian talking about Eddie's success as an actress and um, and that's that seems harmless on one level and I think people people assume it's harmless but it's not harmless when we have measures like this one where the very uh, the very definition of being a woman depends on how you compel other people to talk about you. Um, you see similar things with um, the, the lovely Philip, Philip Bunce, who is a very senior executive at Credit Suisse, who half the week comes in as Philip in his suit and tie, and the other half of the week is Pippa in a dress and fishnets. And um, when Philip comes into work as Pippa, Philip is recorded as a successful woman in business, gets onto the top 100 women in business list. And I think these things do cost women because if people can get through life with the advantages that still exist um, for people who are born male, and then they can claim at the age of 40 or 50 that they now have a female identity and take advantage of measures like this Gender Representation Act to take a space that has been reserved for a woman, we are harming women's outcomes because if those measures are necessary, then they are necessary because women are materially disadvantaged by virtue of their sex. And so I think there is a great cost. Um, and I know that a lot of people that one of the one of the MSPs who actually uh, sat on the committee that came up with this definition um, was on Twitter to, calling uh, calling women names. I think uh, bitches. Um, for not being kind, it costs you nothing. And yet there was this shining example of the reason why it costs something. And I actually think um, there's a cost to trans people too, um, because especially for the, what we might call the old school transsexuals who are actually a tiny, tiny minority of what people usually, of, of what now is encompassed by the umbrella, because I think social kindness made people's lives easier. You know, it's, it's easier to negotiate if people have been, uh, have been accommodating, have been nice in the workplace. But when linguistics become tied to rights, a courtesy, I think, then will be withdrawn. Because if my rights as a woman don't depend on my sex, they depend on my pronouns, suddenly my pronouns are going to matter. So I think then um, what do you see in legislation? Well, one of the things that recently has been extremely concerning was the hate crime bill, um, which I'm sure many people have, have seen as well, the implications of that. But um, during, during that debate and the run up to the hate crime bill, there was quite an outcry on Twitter about um, huge, hugely antagonistic, angry people who are very, very worried about any amendments that might water down, in their view, some of the measures in the hate crime bill. And one of the things that people were especially indignant about was that um, people might not be able to be prosecuted for a hate crime for so-called misgendering. And that was actually something that was picked up in the debate by Patrick Harvey, who um, made, frankly, a terrifying speech um, in which he, he waxed very indignant about 
the evil women's groups who are opposing um, the hate crime bill. And well, we weren't opposing the hate crime bill. We were opposing the fact that they hadn't included women in the hate crime bill. And we were opposed to the fact that they were potentially stifling conversation around the sex and gender question. Um, and that women, of course, as I say, have no protection under this bill. And at the committee, both Hamza Youssef, the Justice Minister, and Quality Network tried to claim women's fears on this were overblown. We actually talked about um, rape victims, potentially, who might be on the stand and be told to address an assailant as, as a woman. Um, we talked about women who have late transitioning husbands who are often told that their life before their divorce was some kind of myth that, that they were married to a woman. And um, we, we said, will these people be prosecuted for a hate crime if they dead name their husband or if they call their assailant a man? And of course they, they were at, they said we were being ridiculous in so many words. But I think we have to consider what happens in countries like Norway, which is often cited by proponents of self-ID as international best practice. And in Norway, a similar combination of hate crime laws and self-ID is really making the situation quite desperate for women. Um, so self-ID went through in 2016 in Norway. And since then, uh, male people who have not undergone any physical transformation, but um, claim a female gender identity, have been entitled to access women's spaces. And shortly after that law passed, a woman was reported to the police because she asked a uh, male person to leave the women's changing room in her gym. And that was even before they had the hate crime law. And that case dragged on for two years. And so now they passed a hate crime bill, which is as an additional error on top of that. Women are very worried. And like Scotland, there is no provision in that hate crime law for misogyny. And that brings me then to the statistics in Norway, where um, between 2015 and 2017, and when self-ID came in in 2016, You've seen a number of women, women in inverted commas, who've been reported for rape in Norway. That has increased by 300%. This week, uh, we saw that in Scotland, Police Scotland are now saying that they will allow suspected rapists to self-declare their gender. Um, and does it matter? Well, yes, it does matter. <laughs> Um, for all sorts of reasons, but not least that if we're going to properly address patterns of offending and do proper assessments of risk and safeguarding and appropriate services for victims and perpetrators, we need to know. This is all, interestingly, there's been this strange crossover between an argument that um, I think women have seen for years coming from a very old fashioned misogynistic line of argument that women do bad things too. Women are as bad as men. And they usually, you know, pluck out of the air the two, two female murderers they can think of in living memory or whatever it is to prove that women can be as bad as men. Um, and we sing this same argument now from trans rights activists who use things like these increased, increased violence from women to prove that women also, women also commit these terrible offences. And the issue here is, I mean, it's not, I, I, I'm not here to say who hits evil, evil men. I mean, that would, I don't believe that at all. But um, it is sadly a fact that 96 to 98% of violent crime, depending on how you slice it, is committed by men. And that has informed how we safeguard women and children, how we run prisons, how we run all kinds of services, shelters and so on, for years. I know um, that Rona spoke um, 
to you the other week and if people didn't hear her I would urge you to search out her um, videos because she is fantastic on the prison service and the impact on women because of course if you take a few violent offenders out of the men's estate in prison it doesn't make that much difference to the men's estate but it can make an incredible difference a hugely disproportionate difference to the women's estate and that's also why debate about conversations about statistics and particularly the census debate it's not some esoteric intellectual exercise because either the census is the gold standard of data collection and the basis that you plan services or it's just this hugely expensive exercise in self-validation um, one of the first things that we did actually um, as a group um, as we started to gain a little bit of traction was to give evidence um, to the committee in 2018 looking at the census and um, I have a huge amount of respect for um, Joan especially because she was one of the first MSPs who really put her neck out um, on this and, and invited this you know really quite little known group along and the committee actually as a whole were, were very very good and really by inviting us and starting this conversation about the census they opened up um, this issue not just in Scotland but I think across the rest of the UK and in other countries as well um, and of course there were data experts who came to that committee all of whom said how important the sex question was. The 80, I think, senior statisticians who wrote to the committee stressing how important this was. But despite all this, um, and despite the recommendations of that committee, the um, authority, the census authorities have been remarkably reluctant to go against the wish, the will of the lobbyists who were trying to play that this should be answered on the completely non-legal category of lived sex. And in Scotland, actually, they were using the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act as precedent for that. So in, of course, Scotland's census is deferred, but in England, Fair Play for Women have uh, just taken the ONS to court last month over this, and they won. Uh, so we'll wait to see how that impacts Scotland and I, uh, I hope that the NRS will reconsider because what was striking, what was really striking about conversations with them was that women on this side had all the arguments and from the other side it was about that people might feel sad, they might not want to fill in the census if they can't put what they want and I don't really think we should legislate because people might be upset. Um, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to be upset if I think that my sex no longer counts for anything anymore. That's going to upset me. <laughs> but nobody seems to be taking that into consideration. And I, I think the other thing is, you know, that, that the nonsense that's often spouted that women are only doing this because they really, really hate trans people. But we actually argued that of course there should be an optional question on that census for trans identity because it's important we want to know how many people there are but if you corrupt the data you will never know so it doesn't help women it doesn't help men and it certainly doesn't help trans people either so who is it helping other than individuals to feel better about themselves it's a hugely individualistic drive um concerningly the Scottish government, um, they set up a, a group, a chief statistician, to, under the chief statistician Roger Halliday to look at sex and gender in data collection. His draft guidance came back quite shockingly recommending that public uh, bodies should collect data on gender identity rather than biological sex unless it was medically necessary. Um, we find this astonishing because, as we say, gender identity is not a not a protected characteristic. Sex is. So, if you're asking about a non-legal category, you're potentially running into data protection issues. 
And if you are not asking about sex, you are potentially setting yourself up in the event of, say, a sex discrimination case at an employment tribunal, you have no, you have no evidence as a, as a public uh, body. Do, do I collect? Well, no, I don't know how many female people I have employed in here. I do not know if I discriminate on the basis of sex because I haven't collected the data. So it's, it's quite an extraordinary abrogation of responsibility that is happening. And when we raise, but when we raise these concerns about self-ID, we're always told, well, this is already happening. Yes, it is. It's already happening, as I've said. But should it be? And I think most people would say, no, it should not be. But it's very hard when you have a government who is so determined. Um, one of the things that came out during our judicial review hearing was that the Scottish government policy is that trans women are women and should be treated as such unless they are prevented from doing this by law. Now that policy seems to have affected everything from funding because um, women's organizations have to have a trans inclusive policy to apply for funding. Uh, it seems to be affecting how they respond to consultations. Um, and we still don't know if, if it is leading them to jettison consultation responses that don't comply with that. And as an FRI revealed on this, there's no legal basis for this policy. But we don't know who decided it. We don't know how it was arrived at. And as I say, we don't know what it's affected. Um, and the problem is this has all been done behind closed doors. Um, one of Joanne Lamont's um, really barnstorming speeches, um, I think she, she mentioned it both in the Forensic Medical Services Bill debate and the hate crime debate. She kept saying that if you want to reform the Equality Act, if you want to redefine men and women, let's have that debate, but let's have it openly. Let's talk about it. And that's, that's really, I think, our position. If, if, if there are people and parties and there are people and parties who seem to want to redefine women, they should have, be prepared to have that debate openly. But the fact it's happening by stealth is revealing. And I think just to finish, I mean, that, that for us, that revelation about policy really made in retrospect the victory over the Forensic Medical Services Bill so much so much better i mean it was, it was great as it was but um that policy um that revelation about the policy meant that that would have been extremely concerning so the forensic medical services bill was a great piece of great great uh, piece of legislation it was to help victims of rape and violent sexual assault and had a whole raft of things that was supposed to make the process of reporting and examination easier one of the things that some of the very brave women who testified um, to the committee said was that they really wanted to be examined by a woman, that for some of them, not being able to have a female examiner had felt like a second violation. We found that the, um, the draft um, bill they referred back to another piece of legislation that used the word gender instead of sex. So we recommended early on in the process that they replace the word gender with sex. And in fact, the committee agreed unanimously with this because it gives legal clarity. It, it shouldn't, if sex and gender, as the government tried to later claim, were synonymous, it should not have mattered. But the problem was it clearly did matter and everything kicked off at that stage and there was a huge amount of pushback and the government really refused to budge for a very long time until um, the six words campaign took off and um, Joanne put in her amendment and it became clear that there were enough people within the SNP who were prepared to um, rebel against this and vote with the opposition. And at that point, the government did row back, but they said oh, it wouldn't have made any difference. But it was quite clear from the reaction, and, and you can't just take a reaction on Twitter, but when you have politicians who are 
openly calling this a transphobic motion. I think um, Sheila Ritchie, who was a former MEP of the Lib Dems, was describing it as taking away rights. And it's quite extraordinary when you are talking about a forensic medical examiner's right to examine the body of a woman who has been sexually assaulted. And I think that shows how upended some people's view of rights and responsibilities and who is, who is deserving of protection has become. So, I mean, that, that, as I say, that was an incredibly positive to um, positive take out of a terribly sad act. The reasons that that um, this legislation needs to exist is is terribly tragic. But I'm not sure if five, three, or even two years ago, we would have had so many MSPs who recognised why there was a need to replace these words. Um, so in that sense, it is, it is good that it was one, and it's good that people are aware, but it's also very depressing, I think, that women are now having to scrutinize every policy and every piece of legislation to try to ensure that it's going to protect us. And unfortunately, I think at the moment, that is where we are, and it is not for people like me who are unpaid to do this I'm just volunteering in in amongst everything else it's it's an incredible weight of responsibility to try to do a job that government and EHRC and the paid women's sector should be ensuring that women's rights are protected and it's a devastating indictment on on those organizations and on Scotland but unfortunately at the moment it is not Thank you, Susan. That was absolutely terrific. Um, and, and you were quite, um, you know, hiding your light under the bushel when I introduced you, saying I gave you a big build up. The amount of work that you and your other directors are doing as volunteers is remarkable. So please don't, um, please take the compliment where it's, it's deserved. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to go on, I've been monitoring the questions uh, that have been coming up in the chat. Um, and if we could go into those um, fairly straightforwardly, um, there, there's one that probably follows on quite well from one of the points you were making. You touched on uh, the Green Party in your, um, uh, your talk for us. And Karen is asking us, What's your view on the Greens policy for removing sex identifiers from birth certificates and other legal identifying documents? Oh, well, I mean, I think that's terrible. I think it's absolutely terrible. I think what's also terrible is the fact that either they haven't read the principles that they're signing up to, or they are just being very dishonest because every response I've heard so far from them is, no, that's not in a manifesto, it's not in a manifesto. Well, the leading human rights lawyer who helped draft those policies says that's what principle 31 says. And I think anyone who's read principle 31 can see that's what it says. So I, I think it's absolutely disgraceful actually that they are either supporting something which they are ignorant about or they are taking, um, people for fools, voters for fools. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to throw this one open to the panel, if you'll bear with me, Susan, to um, Caroline to start off with. Um, and it's from Julie Scott. And Julie's asking, how can we encourage those people who are quietly concerned about this issue but avoid and avoiding talking about it? as they know that they will be labelled the bigot to speak up um, and they don't want to, da much to do too much damage to women's reputations but are still too scared to speak up. Do you want to comment on that, Caroline? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because that highlights just the environment of intimidation that women are having to face and, and very often from men 
who have absolutely no skin in this game. It's almost like a, the men's rights uh, activists have taken over the uh, trans um, trans rights movement. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. I would suggest that any woman who has concerns join for Women Scotland and other grassroots women's groups. Um, within there, you'll, you'll get the support um, that you'll need because you will need it. There is no doubt about it. I recall when I first started asking questions, um, I thought they were reasonable questions. I've been involved in equalities for 30 years. I thought they were very reasonable questions. And then all of a sudden you're getting all this abuse and threats. And the more I further I delved into it and the more questions I asked, um, you started to get smeared. And it's all it's all designed to undermine any credibility that you may have. And that's really, really concerning because a healthy democracy, a progressive country, as you know, Scotland's often very proud of saying that we are, does not deny debate. Everything should be up for debate, respectful debate, but everything should be open for debate. So, as I said, I don't think there's any easy answers. I would strongly recommend that any women who have concerns um, to join for Women Scotland, um, and maybe my colleague, Lynn or Michelle, might have more pearls of wisdom to add. Lynn, do you want to give us your thoughts? Yeah, I totally, totally agree with everything Caroline said, but I, I would... I would say just keep speaking about it. I think we've witnessed a bit of a breakthrough this week, actually. Um, I'm sure everybody who's in attendance has seen the hyperbole over comments that were attributed to my good friend Margaret Lynch in the last week. And I was really heartened to see the fight back that Margaret made because she's a fighter. Um, but I, she spent a lot of time and energy um, Picking up, you know, picking up all these publications and making sure that what she actually said was reported. I think she's done a great job at that, and I think it shows there is a bit of a shift. Actually, there's a bit of a shift. The more light we shine in the matter, um, we're not we're not going away. I'm not going to keep talk, you know, stop talking about this now. We, we we've all been involved for a number of years now. Um, you can't unknow what you know. So I'm not going to stop talking about it. So I would say, talk if you're if you're if you're you know worried about it, um, speak quietly because probably some of your friends share your opinions and your work colleagues. Just keep talking. Join the underground network. Don't think we're underground anymore, Lynn. We're right out there. And actually, we've got an anonymous attendee who's actually reinforcing what you've just said. Um, she was delighted to see the refreshing approach that the Alba Party took standing behind Margaret Lynch this week. And we didn't make a groveling apology because um, it absolutely reinforces what you said. So you're right, people are starting to talk about this. Thanks, Delia. Um, I lost your sound there, so I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, a couple of points to pick up. Brilliant points already made by, by Susan, uh, Lynn and Caroline. I suppose start at the last point first, which is about, you know, how do we speak? Well, as you said, Delia, this has been, a, this has been an important start. Things like tonight are, are, are really important and keeping these conversations going. At our women's conference, the, 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 the most uh, repeated thing said in the chat was the exasperation that women said they felt by being excluded from the conversation about what it is to be a woman um, and the, you know, the effects that, that that's had on their life. Um, the points that, that, that Susan mentioned about um, and, and a question that was asked about removing sex identifiers, this is in my, in my role at the council and as a, a convener for a workforce, obviously looking at fair work and looking at particular sectors and low, you know, women will be expected to earn much less than men over, over their lifetime because of their biological sex, because of the fact that they'll have to take regular breaks to have babies, because impacts on mental health or postnatal depression, or what is quite often women who are also caring for babies and sometimes elderly parents unpaid. And the point, I suppose, from my point of view and from, from my background is if we're, not, if we're not recording this, how can we then, if we're not recording accurately biological sex, how can we record gender pay gap? 
How can we record women's access to services? How can we record FGM? How can we, the, the things that we know define us as, as, as women? But the, the other point that I wanted to come back that Susan made about kind of this whole kind of be kind thing, right? So like probably most people here, I've got four kids and I, I would say I would mostly be kind. But sometimes you have to say to your kids, look, there's a line, okay? Your feelings are important. You are heard. That doesn't necessarily mean I agree with you. I hear what you're saying. I think that for me, what's been really concerning over the last couple of years is this, the idea that women speaking up even um, was threatening, that we were somehow stepping away from our womanhood and being kind by, by pointing out that we had valid concerns. You know, well, what we've learned after fighting through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, well, for the more mature women like me, and what, 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 what we fought for for our daughters and for our granddaughters is that women don't exist as a function to make men feel good about themselves. In and of ourselves, we have the right to exist. We have the right to opinions. We have to the right to express them strongly. So I would say that being straightforward is not being unkind. But we're not required, I should never be required as a voter or as a citizen to put my needs as a female at the back burner and put everybody else, you know, my, my function is to make everybody else feel good about themselves. No, I, I don't think that is. So for, for me, no, I'm no longer speaking quietly. I'm shouting and I'm, I'm, and I'm happy for any other woman who was to shout, um, you know, with us, we've, we've all felt, myself coming from a previous party, um, you know, trying to kind of have these conversations and force them from the inside. You were very much made to feel isolated. You know, you're, and sometimes you question, your, you know, if 99 people are shouting one thing, I have to say overwhelmingly young men, who it seemed to me, when they were choosing to identify as women, had brought all the privilege of their previous gender to their new gender, you know, um, wanting to shout and be the first to talk and to be the first at the queue, you know, um, uh, and, and that, that, that was really concerning. And, and I felt that um, to speak, it was difficult. It's always difficult to put your head above the parapet. You know, if 99 people are going left and you're the only person that's going, you know, I'm pretty sure it's this for guys. You know, you're made to feel um, ignorant, uh, you know, not up to date, old fashioned and kind of, all I would say in that is that people go mad in crowds and come to their senses one by one. And we're coming to senses one by one and we're joining the like-minded women and having these conversations is the most important thing. Sharing this information with each other, sharing these safe spaces. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I'll say on that. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I have a question here from Valerie. Why do you think that it's political parties across Scotland won't discuss these issues? other than the Alaba party. I need to get us in there. Lynn, do you want to start that one off? Because they're cowards. Um, it's horrible. Um, it's horrible being on the receiving end of threats, having to get the police involved on, you know, with your social media. It's pretty miserable, um, especially when you've never held bigoted views, you've never expressed bigoted views. And you're still attacked and called, you know, all sorts of names uh, by people who know nothing about you. Um, and I think if you see that happening to other people, you certainly don't want to be next. Um, however, I think you have a, if you're asking to represent members of the public, um, then you have to grow a set of ovaries. Thanks, Lynn. Um, succinct and to the point as usual. Very, very well said. Um, Susan, do you want to comment on that ar around why political parties are not talking about this? Because your work is actually getting into that very thing. It is. Um, I think initially a lot of them hadn't really thought about it. You know, I, I when this first came in, it was the... Um, the, the Conservatives in Westminster were looking at it, and I think Theresa May saw it as a as an easy win. I think they'd all seen equal marriage and thought, oh, that was a nice thing to pass, and it made people feel good, and it was happy, and nobody, apart from some pretty extreme people who um, 
were talking about the sanctity of marriage, but it's not really affecting anyone else. So brilliant. Or oh, we can do the same thing. We can make the the GRA easier and everybody will be happy. And I don't think they thought through the implications. And the problem was they all jumped on board and signed up and you had these very, very powerful groups who are, and I don't think we can underestimate how deep rooted some of these people have managed to get into political parties and influence thinking because political parties want to be on the right side of history they want to be nice they want to do the right thing and if you have hugely respected organizations who have done amazing things for gay rights telling them that this is the next frontier of human rights they will believe them and um so i think there's an element of shame for some people. And I think you've probably seen that with the row back in Westminster from the Conservative Party, that they are putting the brakes in it, but they're also acutely aware that it was their responsibility. Um, and I think the same has happened with some of the political parties in Scotland. Um, and some of them, I think, thought we were over egging the pudding three years ago. Um, and we just started going and talking to people individually. and. Um, just making inroads with individual politicians and some of the you know there were some great ones who first started to engage with us not not actually always the ones you would know about who's spoken up but people who immediately grasped that there was a rights conflict um the other thing i would say that scotland there's an issue for scotland that probably for the parties down in westminster they can pass stupid laws and then they get sent to the House of Lords, which has all, a whole range of issues around the House of Lords. But one thing that we've seen quite recently with things like the maternity, the House of Lords, because they're not elected, they're not always frightened to stand up and say, no, only women can be mothers. And so some of those things get kicked back. And of course, in Scotland, we don't have that. We only have the courts. And um, actually one of the, the MPs we saw early on immediately grasped this and said, we do not want law to be made in the courts. That's what happened with offensive behavior at football, it's what happened with named person. We need to be getting it right because there isn't this second chamber. Um, and I think not enough political parties and people thought of that. Of course, once, once a few people in some of the parties started to run, they were great. But as Lynn said, they got horrific amounts of abuse. And Joan and Joanna have not been supported. I think potentially um, Joanne and Jenny and Elaine maybe have slightly more within the Labour Party, but they still get a horrific amount of abuse. And especially from the young men. Um, and it, you know, just horrible stuff. All these women have been getting i think you know we um probably the conservatives could say more i think they'd probably get less abuse on this so it would be quite useful if they did as well <laughs> because you know the more people who talk about it from wherever they are and of course in the greens you can't say a thing because poor andy whiteman found his past sorry that was a bit of a long answer <laughs> Not at all, not at all, Susan, thank you. Um, I'm going to go into another question. We've got lots of questions coming in here and I just want to say to the audience, we, I, I'm delighted that you, we've got all these questions, but we're gonna to have to look at how we come back to you subsequently. So I'm gonna pick one or two. I'm taking the chair's privilege to do that. And I'm gonna take this one to, to Caroline. Um, and it kind of follows on from what Susan's just been saying about how parties can be taken down a line with lobbyists. And, and I, this question sits quite well with that, I think. And I see, I think I'll start with Caroline in this one. How will the current excellent, thank you for that, women in equalities policy um, and Alaba as a whole be protected from lobbying and entryism? Um, and how will we stop and put mechanisms in place to stop being influenced like other parties have, not dissimilar to what Susan's just been talking about. Caroline, do you want to kick that one off, please? I think the first thing that we should do, we are having a conference um, sometime in the summer to sort of 
get our constitution in place, etc. I think that what's really important to prevent this happening is having strong mechanisms in place for local democracy, having healthy, open conferences where every member has the same opportunity to bring forward a motion and have it fully and frankly debated at conference. We all know that since 2018, um, my former party, a lot of the mechanisms that were in place, good mechanisms for healthy debate that supported healthy, a healthy democracy were dismantled. And indeed the last conference um, was just window dressing. Uh, there were no specific motions from branches or constituencies. They were all just amalgamated into, into one. So I think that the governing bodies that we elect um, have to have very, very clear uh, mandates with little or no interference from um, parliamentarians. If we get parliamentarians, which judging by the polls, it looks as though we will, those parliamentarians must be held account not only by the constituents but by our party and we do that by ensuring that we have a robust um, constitution in place that is adhered to and not selective parts chosen as and when it's convenient. Thank you. Thanks Caroline. I've got one here that you can quickly answer Susan. People want to know how they can join For Women Scotland. <laughs> Um, the first thing we tell people to do is to sign up to our newsletter. There's a, if you go to our website, there's a take part uh, button, click on that, sign up to the newsletter. The newsletter has all kinds of actions that you can currently do and um, get to get involved. Um, when lockdown is over, we have meetings. Um, we will have meetings again, honestly, and um, that that's usually the best way because it's it's good to meet people face to face and be able to have conversations about that. And the other thing is, if there is anything particular that people think they can do or any experience that they have and an area they know they could do something now on, is just to email us and say hello. I'd like to do this. Um, because I'm always happy to take. The, to, you know if people want to take anything on just to let us know <laughs> thanks susan um... michelle's had to leave us she's doing a hustings tonight and she was at a photo call just before the event so she's a busy woman um i don't know if anyone here that's on the panel can answer this i was going to give this to michelle because she was in the um, she did a lot around employment. It's a question around unions protecting specifically women. I'm not aware of one. Are any of you? I, I've recently had um, an old uh, friend of mine get in touch uh, about the, the route that their um, union was taking um, because certain people have got in the position. Um, so I say that's the way that you actually have to fight back. You have to you know, be involved with your union, you need to stand uh, for positions and you need to, they have to represent you and your views as well. They're important, to, you, you know, and the, the person that got in touch with me was actually, um, there was a drive to um, put pronouns on emails. Now that's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's compelled speech, That that's a nonsense. So it might make some people feel better, I don't think, I think that's a very small minority that would feel better. And I think the majority of people would feel intimidated by that and not actually even fully understand um, why they've been asked to do it. Because quite frankly, your pronouns are none of your business. Um, I'd also like to add at this bit, um, because Marion might be watching and Susan didn't mention that you can also donate money to Forum in Scotland. <laughs> Well done, Len. I was going to pitch that in, but yeah, you got me, you got ahead of me. Well done. Your crowdfunders are, are legends. <laughs> Thank you very much. Not at all. No, not at all. Um, I'm terribly conscious of time. I'm also conscious that we've still got lots of questions, and this is an hour's uh, discussion forum. 
I'm delighted that one of the comments is that people, the, the comment has been made by Helen, it's wonderful to be talking out loud about things we've not, we've only been up until now been had to whisper in corners about. I think that's an indictment on, on the lack of debate that's going on. It's an indictment on people, we've just been talking about pronouns and people not really understanding why that would be the case. So for me, I, I have, this has been a privilege for me to chair this, this discussion forum. And it's been an hour long and as I say, we haven't touched on the questions. We've probably only taken about half a dozen between questions and comments. So I think we can have a look at what, the, what are the questions that are there. Several of them would be a similar answers and think about that. But this is a debate that started in the Alva party. It's not stopping anytime soon. It's, we've got one of the first policies that the Alpha Party put together, much to my personal delight, and I know the folks that are here that are other candidates, was the women and equalities policy. And women were right up front in that. And as far as I'm concerned, and as long as I'm involved, I would certainly be pushing for that. And I know other candidates would be in a similar position. So thank you everyone for coming along. A special thanks to Susan, uh, Caroline, Lynn, and Michelle, who's had to go. Um, it's been a great debate. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. And I think this is going to be the first of several of these events we're doing. So watch our website, and we want to keep this dialogue going. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Sorry, Dale, you see, before we leave, sorry to cut in. Could I just say that when we were developing this policy, we were looking at all of the women's pledges that had, had be, come out over the last couple of years. And we, we did take extracts from those pledges because we know those pledges came from grassroots women. So I would just like to thank all of the women's pledges, the English Greens, um, the obviously the SNP Women's Pledge that Lynn and I were involved in, the Labour Women's Pledge and the Conservative Women's Pledge. Unfortunately, Scottish Greens Women's Pledge were unable to centre women, sadly, but all of the other pledges did centre women. And I want to thank everybody for having the courage to and, and dedicating the time and effort to come up with those pledges that have helped to inform our equalities policy. Thank you. Well said, Caroline. People can't, that absolutely illustrates that this can't be done in isolation just exactly what you said. So women working together can move mountains. So let's carry on doing that. So again, thank you for everyone for participating. And as I say, I see this as the beginning of our journey, not an end in itself. So thank you for everyone who's been attending and we'll have a look at the questions and see what we can do to come back on with folks. Thank you for coming along tonight. Bye. Thanks Delia.